Thank you for joining us and welcome to another edition of Answers Network. I'm your host, Alan Cardoza. Now, for those of you that have been listening, sending in questions and comments, thank you so much. And please continue to help spread the word that every Monday from 11 a.m. to noon Pacific time, this show will bring on special guests that can inspire, educate, and in some cases, entertain, while bringing answers and options to making our lives happier, healthier, and more successful. Now, if you can't listen live, all of our shows, including this one, can be found at answers.network. And I'd really appreciate it if you could all do me a big favor. Forward one of our shows to your social media group and to someone you know who can benefit from a particular subject. This is just one powerful way that we can make a positive influence in the world together. Now, our topic today is one that is it's a very sad topic. And as someone who worked with at-risk youth for many, many years, uh, it's one that I found myself having to deal with parents who had dealt with this particular topic. The topic is suicide. And for those of you that don't know, it's the second leading cause of death in the United States for people between the ages of 25 and 34, the first of which is accidents. And it's the 10th leading cause of death, period, in the United States. Now, our guest, Charlotte Maya, answers the question of how do you survive after a loved one commits suicide? She was widowed at 39 when her children, who were six and eight at the time, I can't imagine dealing with that. Um, and now Charlotte writes and explores the intersections of grief, parenting, and self-care, particularly within the context of suicide. Her work has been highlighted in Hippocampus Magazine and on The Mighty. She's been featured on the A to A Alliance and the Your Next Chapter podcast with Angela Raspes. Charlotte received her Bachelor's of Arts degree from Rice University and her Juris Doctorate degree from UCLA. And she is the author of Sushi Tuesdays, a memoir of love, loss, and family resilience, where she brings light and hope to things most of us are afraid to talk about. Charlotte, welcome to Answers Network. Alan, thank you so much for having me on the show. And, and first, I just wanna thank you, you're sharing with the world such a deeply personal and painful part of your life. Uh, but I know that you're doing it in the interest of helping others cope with their own loss. Um, and I just think that um, it's, it's just an incredibly heartfelt and wonderful thing to do uh, to help other people. So again, thank you for that. It is my pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having the conversation. Like you said, suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in this country and second for the age demographic, 25 to 34, but we don't like to talk about it. And the one thing we know helps is talking about it. Exactly, exactly. Um, now, when I, uh, I was reading the, you know, when I was reading the book, but I also read that the title Sushi Tuesdays comes from your deciding to take one day a week just for you, which helped you process and handle your grief. My thought is, tell us about how that first Sushi Tuesday went because it just must have been difficult. Yeah, that's exactly right. Sushi Tuesdays really is about self-care. So I had a yoga class that I really liked on Tuesdays and then my therapist had a recurring slot open up also on Tuesdays. And so Tuesdays became my day just for me. I First, I called it my Charlotte Shabbat. I dropped the kids off at school at nine or so. And then, you know, I had to pick them up at whatever it was, 2.30 or 3 o'clock. But when you are a single parent 24-7, that five hours um, is, is solid gold. And I worked the other days of the week. So Tuesdays were my day just for me. And so after I dropped the kids off at school, I would think, do I need to crawl back into bed and cry? Because that's real. That's allowed. Do I um, want to go for a walk? I'd never made appointments with anyone, not even coffee with a friend. I didn't see 
Um, I didn't see lawyers or accountants or any, you know, I didn't even do laundry on Tuesdays. That was just, it was my sacred time. What does Charlotte need for her own self-care and healing? And sometimes I would take myself out to lunch to sushi. Like I said, mm -hmm. the kids were little, so they didn't really care about sushi. So that is how my Sushi Tuesdays sort of morphed over time. It became such a sacred day for me that my closest friends didn't call me on Tuesdays, not because they didn't care, but because they knew that that was my time. It was just a very clear boundary for Charlotte taking care of Charlotte. Well, and I think the reason that I brought this up first and, and why I was so... Um, moved by the book is is that it talks about self-care and and i don't think that many people realize how important that is and i think that you know there's you know obviously there's counseling and there's things that we can do uh but to have to set up and to be i think uh, forward thinking enough to know how important the self-care was i think was huge in your own um in your own ability to get through this to get through your own grief um, it must have been equally hard or twice as hard to do this while raising two young boys. Um, share a little bit about that part of it, because I think we're in a time in which there is, um, you know, there is a lot of, uh, a lot of grief. Suicide is, is now one of the fastest growing ways for people to die. Uh, and I just read that, uh, in Canada, they are they are trying to set up a new law that essentially legalizes it or somehow like um, normalizes it that mm -hmm. that it should happen more and the first thing that i thought is is that they are not taking into consideration anything about the people that are left behind yeah okay this is a really big important question that you've asked um, there is a difference between sort of the euthanasia end of this spectrum, and I am not an expert at that. Uh, so someone in this country dies, I think it's like once every 11 minutes by suicide. And the CDC just came out with a new report on teenage mental health, and mm -hmm. our teenage girls in particular are really suffering. There are a lot of demographics within our country, our um, our military, our LGBTQ plus children and brothers and sisters, our communities of color are all at increased risk for suicide. And I think it's important to remember that suicide is not a crime, it is an illness. Depression mm -hmm. is a disease. And when we start to understand, it even when we start to understand suicide and depression as a disease and as an illness, that is different than some end of life decisions um, that, that sometimes people want to make in relation to a fatal disease at a certain age. Um, maybe it's dementia or Alzheimer's or um, something else. <clears throat> so I'm, I, what I am talking about when we talk about suicide is depression mm -hmm. and, um, and this so uh, this part of the illness and even how we talk about it, our language can make a difference. So, for example, a lot of journalists and um, people working in suicide awareness and suicide prevention, we no longer say committed suicide because that word commit has connotations, criminal connotations. Instead, mm -hmm. we'll say things like um, someone died by suicide or even suicide as a verb. He suicided, which sounds a little awkward, but we are practicing at this. And personally, listen, I'd rather have glitchy conversations than no conversations because we know silence is the one thing that does not help in this arena. And you asked about the children and it is um, so it is it, it, children's grief is real and it is as unique as the children themselves because every child, every relationship is unique. And so, of course, the children had different relationships with their father and they're different humans. So they grieve individually. So my task as a mother was to learn how each child expressed their grief and then to be sort of a container for them, to keep them safe, to feel the feelings that they also felt, love, rage, uh, abandonment, 
sorrow and, and to learn how to handle these feelings. Feelings in and of themselves are not fatal. It's their signposts. What needs attention? When the policeman came to my house to let me know of Sam's suicide, they said, we will tell the children that their father died, but you have to tell them how. And we recommend that you tell them the truth because you do not want them to find out any other way. And at a time when nothing made sense, that made sense to me. So honesty and transparency have really guided our journey forward. And when they were little, I used little words, dead, daddy, sick, sad. I didn't say passed away. I didn't use euphemisms. We didn't lose daddy. That's so confusing for children. Right. But to tell the truth in a way that makes sense to them, using words that they can understand, even though it is impossible to understand as a six and eight year old. And even I was 39, it was impossible for me to understand as a 39 year old how Sam could have lost his way and how I could have been widowed to suicide. It made no sense to me. So, yes, it is very confusing for all of us. And I think in particular for young children. But we can't solve the problem of suicide by not talking about it, by pretending it happened some other way. And so that honesty and transparency have really guided my journey with the children and in general. You know, I, I, in one of the most heartfelt things that I read uh, while reading your book and then researching your situation and some of the things that you've written. But I, anyway, I, I read that one of your sons said, daddy would rather die than go to my soccer game. How did you deal with that? I mean, that it just breaks my heart to even say it. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it never stops breaking my heart, you know, to look at my little six-year-old and he was so confused. And when he said it, it was a question, daddy would rather die than go to my soccer game. It just makes no sense. And I think it's important to acknowledge that it doesn't make any sense. There are pieces of the, it's not logical. And again, that's where it's very helpful to understand suicide as a disease. It is not logical. It is not rational. And so when we come at it from that perspective, we can hold the confusion and just hold each other. The, <clears throat> I was terrified that I would be ostracized because of how Sam died, because there is so much shame, so much stigma surrounding suicide for people who are suffering. And for those of us, if somebody has died by suicide, for those of us who love that person and mourn them. And I was really afraid that I would be alienated from my community. But what I found was the opposite, yes. that what I found was connection, that people were aching to have this conversation, that people um, have, listen, as the 10th leading cause of death in this country, there are a lot of people around who have been impacted intimately by a suicide. But since we don't talk about it, we just might not even know. I had dropped the, so Sam had died on a Saturday and I took the kids to school on Monday and I leaned down and told them, okay, I'd last as long as you can. And as soon as you're ready to come home, let your teacher know, and I will come get you. And I didn't know whether they would last five minutes or 10 minutes or a whole day. And they did end up lasting the whole day. And as we had walked toward their classrooms, I noticed people averting their eyes and sort of leaning away from me or walking away. And I thought, okay, here's Here's where it starts. And, but I live in a pretty small town, so there's no way to hide it. I, could, I didn't lie about it even from the beginning. I was just very transparent about how Sam had died. So after I dropped the kids off at their first and third grade classrooms, I turned to walk back home and sort of steeled myself for what I thought was going to be a long, lonely walk home, even though it was only a few blocks. And what I found instead were arms and hugs and tears and people coming toward me instead of being uh, pushed right. away. And that connection has been incredible to me. We might not be able to solve the disease of suicide entirely, but we can solve the isolation. And that is something that, that 
this communication, these conversations. I'm just so incredibly grateful that you're hosting this conversation today because that connection does make a difference. You know, and I'm glad you brought up isolation because I think that that's one of the problems, not only as far as this after the fact, but even that has helped lead to more suicides. Um, what are some of the, what, was there any, um, any warning signs was he, he kind of getting to the point to where he was isolating himself more? Um, is there anything that, although it wouldn't seem like anything at the moment that you look back on and go, I wonder if that was a sign or something that other people out there, if they're seeing it might go, you know what, maybe I need to have a talk with this person. Yes, this is a great question. And a, another reason why when we develop a fluency in suicide, sort of in the same way that we are able to talk about physical health, when we can talk about mental health fluently, then we will all recognize signs, many of which I only recognized in hindsight. Um, for example, he had lost a little weight, not a lot, a couple pounds over the summer, but you know, who doesn't want to lose a couple pounds over the summer? Um, and he was had a lot of job stress. And if you have a job, you have job stress. And if you don't have a job, then you really have job stress. So it seemed not unusual to me. Something that um, I also recognized in hindsight, he had our will and trust out on the counter the night before he died. And now I was a trust and estates attorney. So I reviewed wills and trusts and end of life documents routinely, and it didn't freak me out because I was used to it. And in fact, I had been wanting to revise our own documents because what they said was everything goes to our firstborn and any other child we have in equal shares. But I hadn't named that second child who now we had by name. And so I wanted to review those documents and revise them to include both children by name. I didn't even ask him why he had them out. What if I had? What if I had been a criminal attorney or a civil litigator or, you know, a, a CPA? Would I have thought about it differently? And so having these conversations, then we start to know, okay, you know what? It might be normal. He might have been looking at it to see, oh, let's include Danny and Jason by name. But instead, now I believe that he was looking at it to make sure it was already good enough. Yeah. So when we talk about these things, that those are some of the things that, that I would have known. Sometimes people also will, um, if something seems off, just ask. There's a, there's a fear that if we ask if somebody is afraid, if we ask somebody, are you afraid you might hurt yourself? Are you feeling suicidal? We are afraid that we are going to put that idea in their head. If it is already in their head, we are not going to put it there. And if it's not already in their head, just the fact of having the conversation will let them know you care. They're, you are here for the answers. I have so much hope in this new 988 uh, National Crisis Lifeline. Mm -hmm. Just the fact that we have 988 as a lifeline lets people know you are not alone. There is a place to go. You can call, text 24-7. We didn't have that. Well, actually, we've only had it for, what, a year? And we didn't have it in 2007 when Sam died. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. Share a little bit about that, because I think that there was a lot of people. I recently uh, mentioned something about that to someone, and they said, I've never heard of it. Uh, you know, so um, share a little bit about that. If anybody's out there, that uh, it may be something that... Um, you know, that it'll be good if they know about it. Yeah, it's just like 911, but 988 for mental health crises, and you can call it or text it 24-7. And if, if, if anyone themselves or himself, herself is suffering, then yes, call or text. Or if you're worried about somebody, call or text. These conversations, communication, dialogue, this is what makes a difference and brings us in community together in connection that we find each other and that's everything humans are social creatures and the brain is a social organ so when we know that about ourselves and if we know that depression and suicidal ideation are diseases of the brain then now we have a, a step forward 
Well, in, in your blog and in the book, you, you talk about and you write about a lot about therapy. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of your therapy experiences and some of the things that helped get you through it and some of the things that you now recommend to people that will help them get through the same? Well, the first, what I call sort of the holy trinity of healing is eat, sleep, breathe. Start there. Inhale, exhale, repeat as necessary. Um, if you can sleep, sleep. If you're not sleeping, get some help. Sleep is key to the whole equation. And, um, and eating healthy. I mean, I, I lost 25 pounds in three months because, not because I wasn't surrounded by food. I had amazing friends showing up with food, but I just felt sick to my stomach so much of the time. And pay attention to yourself. That's, I think, meditation or yoga, any of these, just going for a walk, any of these things that bring us into our own body so you can notice what you need. And the other thing I would say is when people say, can, what can I do to help? Just say, yes. Can I do something? Yes. And, and you know what? If you don't know what you need, just let them figure it out. I, was, I, I had a lot of people come up to me and say, what can I do for you? And I'd say, I don't know, but I need everything. And people are amazing. Everyone has a gift. So say yes and let them help you. Somebody sewed a blanket back together that one of my kids had shredded in a fit of rage. It was his favorite blanket and he shredded it because he was so angry and hurt. And then he was devastated that he had just shredded his lovey. And a friend of mine is a really gifted seamstress and she sewed it back together. I had another friend who was really organized and she would collect my mail and she'd pull out all the bills and she'd write the checks. It was back in 2007. So she'd write the checks. She'd do everything except for sign them and she'd put a stamp on the envelope. And everyone has a gift. And so if you want to help somebody, you know that just showing up makes a difference and you'll figure it out. But showing up is the main thing. And you know, I, yeah, we had a lot of therapy, his, his, hers, ours therapists. And I think that really good therapists teach you how you grieve. And, you know, I, and I, I love how you answer that from the standpoint that a therapist isn't just the person that you go to and you sit and you talk to in an office, that you were surrounded by people that were providing different forms of therapy, whatever it was that you needed or whatever it was that seemed to feel right at that moment. And I think that's a really beautiful way to put it because therapy doesn't just come from somebody that sits across the desk. It can come from so many places. And, and I think it's important that people realize that. So that was very, I, I really like that. It drives me crazy when people say time heals all wounds. Time doesn't do anything by itself. It just ticks. What time does is it gives us the opportunity to heal. But you have to do the work. It doesn't happen by itself. And it doesn't end at a certain time. There's no expiration date for grief. Like there's no date on which you can go done, check, I'm finished. It's ongoing. We joke in our house that um, we don't hide the skeletons in our closets. We put them right up on the walls or on the piano or on the mantle, mantle where everybody can see them. Because the truth is that love remembers and grief continues. It's not so heavy now as it was 15 years ago, but there are moments when the children graduate, when they get married, when they have something incredibly special or when they are really suffering. And those are the moments when the grief comes right back. And so it's important to do the work because it's not, it's still going to be there. When, when I, um, one of my dear friends whose father um, had taken his own life when my friend was 10 and his brother was eight, mm. told me, Charlotte, grief is like a heavy sandbag at your feet. And if you do not pick it up, it will trip you for the rest of your life. But when you pick it up, you will notice there's a little hole in the bottom, and that is where the grains of sand start to fall out. And then two things start to happen. One, the grief sandbag gets lighter, and two, you get stronger. And I love that analogy because the, you, you don't get over it, you carry it with you. And we are stronger now, but we still carry it with us. There's never a moment when it's empty. 
you know, you said earlier, um, one of the things that you thought might happen was that, that, that people were going to avoid you. Uh, and, and I know that there are many people and that will say, I don't know what to say. So I do nothing or I say nothing. Um, what are some of the things that you can say and what are some of the things that you can't? And the reason I bring up that second part, and it was actually, it was, it was a line that I said in a, in, in a movie. Um, but you know, the, I was playing the role of a, um, uh, of a priest and, uh, in the 1800s, but, and I said to the, the lead and I, whose son had just been buried. And I said, you know, you know, don't worry, he's in a better place. And the lead said, well, father, to be perfectly honest, I'd rather have him here with me. And you, you know, and it, so that was one of those things to where, and when we talked about that line, we talked about it being an inappropriate line, but yet one that people will say when they don't know what to say. Yeah. Um, so what are some of those things that, uh, that you feel could help people feel a little more comfortable uh, when, they, when they come into that situation to where they know somebody who has just lost someone? I wish there was like a magic sentence that we could say there, there really isn't. Um, I personally, I like, I'm here for you. I'm with you. Um, and it's, it's helpful to have friends who are willing to engage in what might be a difficult conversation. Yeah. The better place theology is super bad, especially in the area of suicide, because people would tell my children at six and eight, that daddy was in a better place. And so my six-year-old said to me, well, if daddy's in a better place, shouldn't we go to? And that is logical and horrifying. Yes. And so we talked a lot about that. And I too said the same thing to, I can't remember who, but yeah, you know what? We need him here. We, it, it, God doesn't need him more than we do. That just doesn't make any sense to me. Or the whole idea that there's a divine who planned this. I don't need that kind of plan. Thank you very much. Um, but I do believe in ethology of presence. And I think that presence shows up on my front porch with lasagna and casseroles and enchiladas. I think that presence shows up to drive carpool. I think that presence shows up in the middle of the night when I can't sleep and is also at her computer writing emails at the same time. I, um, those were things, you know, the, the plan is really upsetting. I, I, I don't need someone who planned the death of a good and kind man. One of the things about suicide is it, it, the shame and the stigma threaten to reduce someone to the last moments of their life. And that is so unfair. So one of the things that talking about suicide does is it allows those of us who have lost someone we love to suicide to bring our loved one back into their full humanity. Were they perfect? No, nobody's perfect. But were they loved? Yes, desperately. Are they funny and smart and kind? Yes, they are all those things. And so opening that part of the conversation back up, I guess as I'm talking, one thing that I would say, say their name. Don't be afraid to say Sam or Debbie or Vincent or Esme. Say their names. They are beloved. And you're not going to remind me that he's dead. You're not going to remind me that he's gone. I know that. So say his name. Talk, that's, you know, talk about the beloved. Maybe there's a story you know that their loved one might not already know. First of all, say it again and again and again. We won't get tired of hearing these beautiful stories about our loved ones. But maybe there's something we don't already know, and that would be a gift. Wow. The book is Sushi Tuesdays, a memoir of love, loss, and family resilience. We're speaking with Charlotte Maya. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. You're listening to or watching Answers Now. Founded over 30 years ago to meet the needs of families in crisis. 
Westfield has continually focused on resolving issues that negatively impact families and businesses. Our signature therapeutic transportation service helps to ensure that adolescents in crisis are safely transported to specialized school programs and treatment centers with unsurpassed experience and success. We are supported by our full service licensed investigation agency that has legally, professionally, and compassionately located hundreds of runaways and teens. We are experienced and qualified to help, offering solutions which may include referrals to our international network of top professionals in the fields of educational consulting, psychology, psychiatry, and investigations. Simply put, West Shield Adolescent Services and West Shield Investigations are the best solutions when your family is facing a personal crisis. Call 1 800 899 8585. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's 1 800 899 8585. Or visit our website at westshield.com. Thank you. And we're back. We're speaking with Charlotte Maya. And we're talking about the subject of suicide. Uh, Charlotte, um, um, what did your grief teach you about motherhood? Uh, I mean, you were thrown into this at a time, again, for those that are just tuning in. Um, you know, when your boys were six and eight, how did that, what, what, what did you learn that you might not have learned any other way? Well, I think a lot of things about motherhood. Um, the children teach us what they need. It is always amazing to me that, you know, a seven pound larva has an opinion and is able to express it, even though they have no marketable skills or language facility. Um, and the same is true with grieving children. I think the biggest thing it would teach me about motherhood is, is really just being honest with the children and having these conversations. The children are 22 and 24 and the conversation continues. We use bigger words now and my youngest one who's about to hopefully graduate from college with a degree in psychology teaches me now. And, and in some ways that's always the case. There were, you know, we used a lot of four letter words after daddy died and I won't say them here, but you know what they are. And, and one of the things is, you know, those are just words. And sometimes we need little words for big feelings and that was okay, but I can't save you from the principal if you use them at school. So, you know, teaching the kids about that and, and learning some, you know, they just, they, they come in their own time. One of my kids refused to say the D words, dead and daddy for years, years and to be patient with that process. The other one, of course, naturally, if you have two or more children, they will have at least that many opinions. Um, it, then the other one wanted to talk about dead daddy all the time. So mm -hmm. finding the space for each child, parenting children in grief in some ways is very, it's just the same as parenting children through all the other things that they go through, just being open and humble I always say, you know, if your first child didn't humble you, the second one will bring you to your knees because they come as they come. And just with everything else in parenting, being open, willing to learn. If the first parenting book isn't the right fit for your kid, get the next one, get a different therapist, find the one who gets it, who gets your kid, who gets the struggle that's happening in your own house. Because as many children as there are, there are that many unique and beautiful and heartbreaking ways to be in the world. So I think it just, you know, opened me up even more as a mother, more patient. And, you know, we can laugh about a lot of things. It's, life is funny and it's okay for it to be funny. It's okay for us to have joy. It's, it's, we, Daddy would want us to have joy. If he had been in his right mind, he, he, he would have had a whole different perspective. It's a great point. Now, do you think there's a difference between grieving a loved one's death uh, if they're dying from old age or health-related illness, something that all of us will go through at some time in our lives, and that or a loved one whose death is from suicide? I do think that suicide has its own sort of shade of thorny. Um, but it, I mean, it's similar to a lot of other deaths. And listen, there is no better or worse in this space. It all stinks in its own unique way. Um, it, there is a, a guilt 
with suicide that is especially sticky. It was much easier for me to forgive Sam his suicide than it was for me to forgive myself. Mm. I think that, you know, there are a lot of deaths and sudden deaths after which we feel a lot of anger and rage. I think that that is certainly true with suicide. I think that the complexity comes um, from the guilt and it's so out of order. It just feels so out of work. Both of Sam's parents were alive when he died. And mm. it just, it, it's, it's impossible, but it's not impossible. Um, you, you just said you had more difficulty forgiving yourself. What do you mean by that? Well, as we were talking about before, some of the warning signs that I didn't know were warning signs. And it's, you know, it's this like cyclical game that is um, so tenacious. Like, what if I had said something different? What did I say? What didn't I say? What didn't he say? And when I, whenever I talk about Sam having made a mistake, what I mean by that is he didn't ask for help. One of the things my therapist and I talked a lot about, she would say over and over again, Charlotte, you are 100% responsible for your 50%, but you don't get Sam's 50%. You don't get the children's 50%. You don't get anybody else's 50%. You just get your 50%. And that was very helpful for me to start to release that guilt, that, like, that feeling that I know I can turn back the clock if I I'm just can figure out the key. There's just that desperation to go back and figure out what I was missing. Um, it's not always easy to know which was my 50%, right? Especially with children, as, as they are young, we take over so much as parents of their growth and healing and learning and letting them grow up is a gift to us and to them. I would say if I do my job right and they do theirs, they won't really need me so much. And that's heartbreaking and also beautiful. And well, with the loss, it's similar. You, know, you, you mentioned in regards to depression, which we know is a, a mental health condition. Um, I think one of the things that if there's something that we can, that we can say or do that gets people to, to make a difference is to work on the stigma. And I think mm -hmm. especially for males and males of, of my generation uh, is, you know, the, this thing of, you know, I'm too tough. I can't, you know, you know I can't talk about these things. Um, I was just having a conversation with the love of my life. And I was talking about that as a teenager, I, I went to therapy and the therapist said, you're underage, you, know, you have to have your father come in. And I asked my father if he'd come in and his answer was, and there was another word in there, but it was, um, you know, are you freaking crazy? We don't do that. And so what are some of the things that we can do to, to, deal with the stigma for people to understand that, as you said, it is a disease, it is not a weakness, and it's something that if we can have somebody to talk about it, to talk about it too, that there's a much better chance that we're going to find a way to get through it. Yes, I think in understanding that it is a disease, it is, um, it's not an epic fall from grace, it's not a character flaw, it is a disease like any other disease, and we can learn to talk about it, just like we talk about diabetes and cancer. You know, we didn't used to say the C word, cancer, out loud either, mm -hmm. and now that we do, there's more research, there is more uh, resources dedicated, and the, the conversation is what we know especially helps. There was an article, I think it was in in the New York Times just this weekend about having conversations, just reaching out. I'm here for you. What do you want to talk about? Showing up, going to coffee together and having a, a heart to heart is healing. David Brooks had, had an op-ed also in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago about a, a friend that he had lost to suicide. Mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful article. I recommend it and he talks about that his friend had asked for help. And so 
his friends, spouse and children, and David Brooks also is a friend, they were able to be with their friend in this fight. And ultimately the friend did die by suicide, which is horrifying. But as David Brooks says in the article, the one thing I didn't feel was regret because he was able to show up for his friend. So having these right. conversations, we not, might not be able to stop the disease of suicide and, and depression altogether, but we can address the isolation. Sam had a cousin who died from breast cancer about a year after he died from suicide. And at Carol's funeral, one of the other cousins was really angry and said, you know, Carol was fighting for her life and Sam just threw his away. And it made me so angry because mm -hmm. As I said, Carol was Carol had chemo. She had doctors. She had therapists. She had women showing up with casseroles and driving the baby, the their little boy who was three, so he wasn't really a baby, but he was very little, driving him to preschool and, and babysitting and driving carpool. And Sam was fighting just as hard, but he was fighting alone. Let's not fight alone. And you are right. You there is a gendered component to suicide and. Three times as many, I think this is still correct, three times as many women attempt suicide, but three times as many men die from it. So, and this is not true for all men or all women, but we can all have better conversations. No, Let's I... let each other know how we're really doing. Not just, I love pictures of the kids and the holiday cards, but, you know, let's flip it over and see what's behind that because we will find connection and community. Now we, and again, for everybody, um, you know, if you get a chance, you know, check out the book because the book goes into uh, very great detail as well as there are times in which there's humor. There's times in which it really talks about love and resilience. So you can do that. But now um, I read that, so you started, with a blog and was that one of the things that you did specifically for your own grieving so that by having this blog was it a way to communicate and and get these feelings out there which i guess later on you eventually used the same title and that became your book as well is that right yes sushi tuesdays the blog turned into sushi tuesdays the book i would say to be honest i i People say, oh, the writing must have been ther very therapeutic, but I had a therapist for, and that was therapeutic. For me, the writing became a matter of craft, learning how to, I was an English major and a lawyer, so I'd written a lot of things, but really learning how to write about something that is so tender and to do it in a way that was accessible. And so learn the, the writing piece for me was really a matter of craft. I hired a book coach. I, I ran the blog for several years and I published every Tuesday. And at the end of several years, I had a whole thick notebook worth of posts. And as I started to read it, I, I could see that it wasn't a coherent narrative, but I didn't quite know how to get there. So I hired a book coach and several drafts and several years. It took me 10 years to write this book. So it was really, it, I, I felt like this was a story that was demanding to be told and it really wouldn't let me go until I had told it. And now that you've told it and now the book is out there and, and because you had the blog, did the blog also enable you to connect with um, other widows or victims in general of suicide? Yes, I, um, so, it, uh, so Spoiler alert, I accidentally fell in love again with the most eligible widower in town. And um, um, when I started the blog, Tim and I talked about what that would be like, because they are intimate stories of what grief looks like. And it mm -hmm. did involve our children, you know, breaking Legos and, you know, rules. And... <clears throat> We decided that if by sharing my story, I could help just one person, then it would make a difference. It would be worth it. And I, after I published my first post, I think it was within 48 hours, I got an email from a friend of a friend who said, Charlotte, my twin brother has recently died by suicide. And mm -hmm. I am so grateful 
for your writing because there is hope and I'm not alone. And she was my one. And every one since then, I just, every one makes a difference. Now, one of the things that you talk about in the book uh, that you went through a period of time uh, feeling frustrated with God following mm. Sam's death. Um, how did you come to reconnect with your religion despite the anger that you were having at that time? Yeah, I was really angry at God, which turns out to be, you know, if, if, if God is your thing, it turns out to be a pretty safe place to put mad. <clears throat> and uh, as I told a friend of mine, you know, I'm not really on speaking terms with God anymore because I, you know, I, I did what I was supposed to do and tragedy happened anyway. It didn't make sense to me that a God would, a loving God would let this happen. So I really wrestled a lot with my faith. I called God a lot of names, some of which, um, well, none of which began with father and some of which began with mother. <clears throat> and about a year after, the first year after Sam's death, so we called it the first death anniversary, a mutual friend of mine invited me to go to church and she invited it in such a love, invited me in such a lovely way. She said, I know it might be the last place that you want to go, but I would love for you to join me and my family to church and we can go to brunch afterwards. And as soon as she issued the invitation, I knew I was safe whether I said yes or whether I said no, that my relationship with her was intact. And then I realized it really was someplace I wanted to go. And the, the pastor that day was explaining how angry he was after his 10 year old had died. I think he was 10 from cancer and how very angry the pastor was at God and that he, that by wrestling with God, he was staying engaged. And I thought all this time I've been calling God names and all God hears is that Charlotte is calling. And that for me sort of was the beginning of a restoration of my faith journey. I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> yes, yes, I think it does. Um, and I just looked up, we, we only have about another minute or so. We have a comment that, is, that came in uh, and this one reads, um, suicide was a major topic during the pandemic from uh, youth to older individuals who uh, lost their will to live. I so applaud your courage to write about this topic and because it speaks to how people may be hiding deep depressions that are not readily apparent to those around them. And you've already answered the question that followed that, but uh, that was from Sarah in Florida. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. And check in with your people, people. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, and uh, I've, I've got another quick question. I'm going to try to squeeze this question in. And um, if we're unable to get it answered, maybe we'll, we'll you can answer, we'll put it on uh, either on, on your blog or on your website or something where people can do that. This one reads, my father and my uncle, um, who was like my second father to me, both chose to take their lives after months of battling cancer. Although these events were 10 years apart, the loss was devastating for our family because their treatments were still going on and we had hopes for positive outcomes. Although I know your experience was different, losing loved ones so unexpectedly has lifelong ripples in a person's psyche. My brother told me about your interview on Alan's show and we're looking forward to hearing your story as well as reading and sharing your book with uh, our siblings. And this is from Aubrey in New Mexico. Aubrey, I am with you and thank you. All right. Um, again, the book is Sushi Tuesdays. Um, it's a memoir of love, loss, and family resilience. Um, so Charlotte, can I assume it's at anywhere one can get books or is yes, it best it is. to go to your website? Anywhere you get your books is you will be able to find it. Yes. Okay. And if, if you do want to go to the website and learn a little more, uh, it is Charlotte dash Maya, M A Y A dot com. Uh, Charlotte, we, anything else you would like to share before we say goodbye? Well, I'm just so grateful to you for hosting this conversation. I'm grateful to everyone who is listening to this conversation and just to know that the, the story isn't over. All right. And uh, when we spoke a little bit, I think off the air, and I met, uh, asked about if there's another book um, 
let us know when you have another one coming out. We'd love to have you on. I'd love to hear more about it. And again, thank you so much for sharing this very heartfelt story with us. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. All right. Now, for everybody out there, uh, please be with us next week when we're joined by Genevieve Hawkins, and she discusses her new book, Mentally at Work, Optimizing Your Health and Business Performance. And please visit our archives of past interviews at answers.network, or you can subscribe to the show through Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, SoundCloud, YouTube, Rumble, Spreaker, and so many more. Uh, and please, if you if you like what you hear, you know, go to the site where you listen, leave a review, because it helps us reach more people. And I want you to know we greatly appreciate it. And also, the next time you're on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, please remember, stop by our page. That's answers.network. Uh, and check out some of our latest shows. If you like them, please like us and spread the word. For everybody out there, be good human beings and be with us again next week on Answers Network. You're listening to Answers Network with Alan Cardoza, only on LA Talk Radio.